Okay. Okay. Uh, do you see my shared screen at this point? Yes. Okay. All right. So now we're going to go back over the same territory, but with multiple traits. And uh, so. Um, So why multiple traits? Well, here's, here's uh, this is Wilson's Bird of Paradise from New Guinea. And you can see that just to describe the color of this bird, you would need <laughs> quite a range of colors and there's multiple morphology. We know that, tra that organisms have multiple traits, at least, at least most multicellular organisms do. And, uh, and so we want to capture, have a model for inheritance and response to selection that captures that multiple trait, that multivariate nature of, of, of many life forms. Okay, so here's our, our thesis for this part of the lecture, and that is the, the statistical approach we use with a single trait can be extended to multiple traits. The key statistical parameter that emerges is going to be the G matrix rather than a single scalar called, that we call G. The G matrix is going to affect the response of the multivariate mean to selection and to drift. Those are the main points we want to cover. It's just to take our earlier discussion into multiple trait space. We're gonna look at multivariate resemblance between parents and offspring and point out that it's captured by the G matrix. We're gonna enlarge our model of inheritance so it's multivariate. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, we'll just mention the fact that the G matrix can equilibrate to opposing forces that act upon it. So the equilibration of G is a reasonable idea. And finally, it's the G matrix that affects the evolution of the multivariate mean. And uh, we're gonna be spending a wonderful period of time with Adam tomorrow talking about the G matrix, but this is our inter introduction to the idea. Okay, the idea in multivariate resemblance is that different traits can run together in families. So if we go back to the garter snake example before, if we plot the daughter's tail count against the mother's mom's body count, we see uh, a weak, but it turns out statistically significant relationship. And if we plot vice versa, daughter's body against the mom's tail count, we also see a similar relationship. Um, and I'm not gonna bounce out to this animation just because we're a little short on time now. But what you would see is boot street, bootstrap sampling of these two bivariate distributions. And we're gonna look at that in uh, Joseph's lab a little later today. Okay, so here's our earlier model uh, in which we had uh, Z equal to uh, an additive genetic value plus an environmental value. Now we have vectors representing the two traits. So we have a column vector with Z1 and Z2, and that's equal to a column vector plus another column vector. And basically we're just saying the same, uh, we're saying this, uh, the same thing for each of two traits. Likewise, the mean expression is a, is a relationship in column vectors. Uh, the, the phenotypic variance though now becomes a matrix. So this P11 term is the variance phenotypic variance that we'd observe with a large sample of individuals, for example, from population. That's the, we're gonna call that P11. P22 is the phenotypic variance of, of, uh, of the second trait. P12 is the, pheno, is the phenotypic covariance between the two traits. And likewise, we have a genetic, uh, two by two genetic matrix and a two by two environmental matrix. This is the G matrix for, for two traits. Notice it's always symmetrical. Uh, all of these matrices are symmetrical. That is to say, uh, the, the, this, this element is, this, is I identical to this element. All right. Now, what, what about this G matrix? Um, well, one way to think about it is that it describes a cloud of genetic values. It is uh, a cloud of genetic values, X we called them before. Sometimes they're called breeding values. I think. Uh, Pat's gonna call them breeding values tomorrow. So if we, it, this is a hypothetical example. Imagine we have uh, genetic values for trait one for a whole set of individuals and genetic values for uh, a second trait. Uh, and we plotted them against each other. That is X1, X2 plotted as a function of X1. 
uh, individual by individual. And we get a cloud in our hypothetical cloud looks like this. And uh, we've actually sampled from a G matrix so that the genetic variants have been standardized to a value of one and the genetic covariance between the two traits is 0.8. Um, and I'm gonna show you the expression again, but we can refer to this matrix as, as describing a genetic correlation of 0 0.8. Uh, now, what are the causes of this, this cloud being tilted like this? So that there's a net positive relationship. That it's actually a pretty strong correlation. The causes to, could be twofold. They could be pleiotropy, that is individual genes or that tend to have an effect, positive effect on one trait tend to have a positive effect on the other, or it could be a linkage disequilibrium. That is to say, there could be non-random associations between alleles at different loci uh, with a preponderance of, of positive associations, uh, not just linkage, but linkage disequilibrium. Uh, here's our express, this is a standard expression for a correlation, but in, since these are, genetic variances and covariance are expression for uh, the genetic correlation is this. This is the genetic, so this is a kind of standardized genetic covariance, right? After the standardization, this, this correlation can range from minus one to plus one. The other thing that we've drawn here is axes through the cloud. And these are, you can think of principal components. So here's the first principal component that explains most of the variation in the cloud. And here's the second principal component, uh, an axis perpendicular to the first. Um, and uh, 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 later on though, we're gonna to refer to these as eigen, equivalently as eigenvectors and, 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 and eigen, well, eigenvectors. So this is the leading eigenvector, same as the first principal component. This is the trailing eigenvector, same as the second principal component. Each of these eigenvectors has a, uh, a variance associated with it. And the variance along this axis is called the eigenvalue of the leading eigenvector. And the variance in this direction is the uh, eigenvector of the trait, the eigenvalue of the trailing eigenvector. Just, it's just, a matter of vocabulary and notation. I've also uh, represented uh, the whole cloud of values with a 95% confidence ellipse for the bivariate mean. And so we'll often uh, represent uh, a whole T matrix as a simple ellipse like this. You'll see this, especially in Adam Jones's lectures coming up for tomorrow. All right, so just to take our our, our newfound appreciation of multivariate inheritance for the case of the garter snakes. Uh, we've, got, we've got four, four plots that get, uh, uh, from which we estimate the three parameters in this matrix. From the plot of daughter's body versus mom's body count, we estimate G11. From daughter's tail as a function of mom's tail, we estimate G1, G22. And from, uh, body versus tail and tail versus body plots, these two, we make a combined estimate of those two since they should have the same covariance, genetic covariance, we get a combined estimate of, of um, for G12, the genetic covariance between the two traits. And here are the actual values from the, uh, from the, of those covariances and variances for the, for the data set. Uh, and I think I can't remember if that's the data set you're going to be analyzing. What about prevalence of genetic correlation? Now, these kinds of genetic correlations are surprisingly common, particularly for morphometric data. So in black, these are life history traits and shaded, but in black, the, our focus today, you can see that there's a, uh, a tendency for, for uh, morphometric traits to have significant positive genetic correlations. So this is a very, depending on the trait, can be a very common phenomenon. Again, our model for uh, equilibration of, uh, of genetic variance, uh, covariances of the G matrix is the same model as before, uh, a little bit more complicated when you lay out the terms, however, but it's the same idea underlies. And I haven't shown the extension to with drift and migration. Let's talk a little bit about uh, 
about uh, so that's why we don't we, we don't run out of genetic covariance uh, or we don't shrink the G matrix down to nothing. We have, there's restoration by uh, mutation and and, uh, and correlation. Um, let's look at uh, correlational selection, uh, which is one kind of uh, stabilizing selection that can produce linkage to this equilibrium and, and constant, consequently contribute to the, the covariance between two traits. So let's let's look at a uh, a hypothetical population of grasshoppers in which we have um, four morphologies that we can see. We have green grasshoppers, brown brass, grasshoppers, green grasshoppers with brown heads, brown grasshoppers with green heads. And to each of these, uh, we have a particular uh, two locus um, genotype that produces that kind of, that kind of grasshopper. Now, what we're going to imagine is the, that in the population, their selection for matching colors of the head and body. That is to say, we have selection for crypsis that takes the form of favoring these two genotypes in the population. That kind of selection will produce linkage disequilibrium, a linkage disequilibrium between the two, between the two loci. And that and will be reflected in a genetic correlation between the colors of the grasshoppers in the population. And this is this we can call correlational selection because we're uh, it's a particular kind of selection that's increasing the correlation between the trait between the two traits, head and body colors. All right, just to, just I don't know whether you thought about linkage disequilibrium in this way before. All right, now let's go back to the idea of changing the multivariate mean with directional selection. Uh, let's, let's, this is the same plot as before, a, an offspring parent plot, but now we're gonna plot offspring values for trait two as a function of mid-parent, that's the average of the two parents for trait one, all right? So the, the point is it's possible now for there to be a negative correlation between, uh, between uh, uh, the points in this plot. And the consequence of that negative correlation will be that if we select on trait one, we can get a negative response to selection in the other trait. So we're only selecting on trait one, but we produce a negative of, uh, change in, uh, in the mean in the other trait. So this is what's called a correlated response to selection. And this is a new phenomenon that we didn't have to think about uh, in, the, in the single trait case. But um, in, the, in the world of multivariate traits, this is, this is a major concern that we want to take into account. And in fact, we can take it into account. And it means that we routinely use the entire G matrix to correct for the effects of this kind of negative or positive correlation. OK. If I was in a classroom, I'd ask you how many of you have had uh, matrix algebra? And I would imagine that some subset if you have, but there's another subset that haven't. So here's a, here's a quick lesson. The directed correlated response to selection. Okay, so now uh, what we wanna think about is this response to selection equation for the, in the two trait case, just to ease into the multivariate case. So the change in the mean from one generation to the next we're gonna represent as a column vector, Z bar one, Z bar two. And that, that equation is going to be, let's use this one, the G matrix post multiplied by the, uh, a vector of selection coefficients that we're gonna call beta rather than S. I'm gonna tell you about them more in a minute. Notice that these, should, these ones and twos and the column vectors of beta should be subscripts, not anyway, little typo. So, how do we expect, how do we predict what the response to selection in trait one will be? Well, you multiply to get the response. The response, it's got these two parts. The thing to remember is rows times column, this row times that column. And that, that rule of multiplication is, gives you this row, G11 times beta one, G11 times beta one, plus G12 times beta two gives you this result. 
this row times that column, G12 times beta one, there's that re result, uh, plus G22 uh, times beta two gives you this, this result here. Now, why is this, I, I have to look at my next slide because I, all right, let me tell you what we've got here. This, <clears throat> This is the direct response to selection in trait one by selection on trait one. But there's also a contribution to delta Z bar one that comes from selection on trait two acting through the genetic covariance between the two traits. Likewise, the change in Z bar two is a function of a direct, a direct response to selection plus a correlated response to selection, that is selection on, uh, uh, I, yeah, it's on, on the first trait acting through the genetic correlation to produce a contribution to the set, the change in the second trait. All right, so um, how are we doing for time here? We're in pretty good shape. Um, if you played pool, I think uh, this is a helpful way of thinking about what we've just been talking about. So, for example, uh, we can think of a think of uh, uh, a cloud of uh, genetic values, and I haven't shown them here. And in the center, we're thinking of of the bivariate genetic mean, which is also equal to the genetic uh, the phenotypic mean. And we're imagining that selection acts only on trait one, so that it's it's a vector in which the B one element is of this length, and there's zero for the for the second element. And we have that selection act on this, this, on this mean, it will change the genetic mean from a position there to a position here. Um, what are we talking about here? Let's go back. We're setting beta, beta one is, 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 is we're looking at the response in, in trait one. Uh, we're selecting just on, trait one. So when we look at the response, it's just a direct response because beta two is zero. The direct response is just what you would expect, right? Contrast that with this situation in which we've got a positive correlation, genetic correlation between the two traits. Now we select on, on this, on, 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 I think I misspoke before. We have selection just on trait one. Let's go back. What happens? We have selection just on trait one. So we get a direct response to selection, but we also get a correlated response through, um, through this trait, through the second. We get a correlated response uh, changing Z bar two. Here it is in the graph. This is the direct response and this is the correlated response that happens because there's a, a genetic, a non, there's a non-zero genetic term. But I forgot to mention this is a zero term there. Let's let me show you an animation now. If I can get my thing to go away. <laughs> Lord. Come on. Jeez. Can you hit F11, Steve? Up 11? Uh, F11 on your keyboard. F11, I haven't used that, but sure. Will that maximize it by any chance? Or you yeah. can go view and then do slideshow. <laughs> Actually, Hasten just I can't, put- uh, I can't slide around in this figure. Uh, Steve, Hasten just put it in the chat link. If you want to hit that. Yeah, I wanted to show this because it's cute. <laughs> it's the same animation. It's just the link that you're trying to click, I think. No, I can't click on the animation just because it, it's in the it's in the chat now, I think. Did you play it in the chat? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, the animation helps to understand me, I think, a little bit. Let me show you this animation. Uh, okay, this yes, okay, this animation's better uh, because the. All right, 
here, watch this animation. And then you have to add the sound effect and you change the position of the, of the genetic mean. Here's the a response, a direct and a correlated response to selection coming in from, um, from uh, the genetic covariance being non-zero. And then if we watch down here, you can see that <clears throat> uh, taking a, a, a G matrix with a positive genetic correlation, depending upon the angle of, uh, of selection uh, symbolized by this beta vector, the, uh, the contribution of the genetic covariances increases see, as we get closer to the alignment of the Q vector with the uh, leading eigenvector of G. So here's your homework problem. As you fall asleep tonight, remember this diagram and try to summarize what you're seeing in one sentence using your new vocabulary about beta vectors and eigenvalues, uh, vectors, <laughs> so, okay. All right, we're almost, almost gonna make it through this animation. I mean, through this lecture. Okay, so what have we learned? <clears throat> In an abbreviated way, we've learned that the additive genetic variance covariance matrix G is the key to understanding multivariate resemblance between parents and offspring. Now we use just a simple two by two case. We can go to as many characters as we want, but then the G matrix becomes a hyper, a hyper volume, a hyper ellipse, and uh, it's just a little bit more complicated to think about it, but it's the same principle. And whether you're in two-trait two space or multi-trait space, multi-trait space, the G matrix is also the key to, multi, to modeling multivariate responses to selection. And in fact, what are we talking about? We're talking about this equation here. And notice we've needed to use this in the simplest use of this equation. We've needed to use this, this, uh, uh, this parameter beta. And we're gonna talk about that in the next lecture. Our final point was that G induces correlated responses to selection that can be non-intuitive. Particularly if you don't know about the genetic covariances underlying the traits that you're looking at. References uh, as usual. And um, we've got, if we keep to schedule, actually we have, we have plenty of time for discussion because we were going to have discussion till 1130. Uh, and we'll see if you've got enough questions uh, to do that. I'm going to leave Our, this, this up here. Let's go to, uh, let me answer any questions you might have about this lecture since I've got the, the, um, the projection right up here. Shall I, shall I um, continue recording at this point or break from recording? Uh, what do you, well, we're going to have, we're going to have questions from the participants. Do you want to record those? I thought you did. I think I will not. I think I will yeah. uh, stop recording. Give me a moment and I will do that.